I'm ready to bring it you. I welcome each of you on behalf of our county executive, Stephen Newhouse, uh, to the fourth, the fourth annual Orange County Prayer Breakfast. This morning's prayer breakfast is patterned after national prayer, prayer breakfast, and that's explained in detail in your programs. Uh, you have at your seats. So in that regard, we, you, we're going to be hearing from lay leaders this morning. You can read more about that in the prayer card. And I encourage you to look up the National Prayer Breakfast and its history. Uh, it's fascinating and it is God glorifying. We are so glad and grateful that so many residents of Orange County and beyond of many faiths have come together this morning. We join together to pray specifically, and this is a reminder as we start, we pray specifically for all leaders of the county. So what does that mean? It means government, business, nonprofits, educational leaders, medical leaders, first responders, military, law enforcement, parents, heads of households, colleges, schools, churches, and temples, community, and all other leaders, all of those leaders. Today's a day to encourage our souls to hope, for we truly have our hope set on the living God. Amen? Amen. All for his glory and our joy. Amen? Amen? A heartfelt thank you to all of our sponsors. The breakfast would not be possible without you. The sponsor names are at the table. Please take a moment during the, the, the morning to have a look at those. We thank you very much. Uh, we thank all of the sponsors and all of you for being part of this uh, special event. So now what we do most years since we're in November, acknowledging that we recently celebrated Veterans Day, we now ask all of the military personnel and veterans joining us here this morning to please stand so that all of us can recognize and thank you for your service. Thank you. Folks standing up throughout the entire room, even up here. So thank you very much. Now they're serving for a purpose, so please pause right now for a few moments in silent reflection and prayer for the families of those who have lost loved ones in recent tragic and senseless acts at houses of worship, synagogues, and social gatherings. Amen, Lord. Amen. Let's continue now with a formal opening prayer delivered this morning by Colonel Marlon Crook. Colonel Crook is commander of the 105th Mission Support Group at Stewart Air National Guard Base in Newburgh. He commands six diverse units responsible for all base facilities, support, readiness, and logistical functions. He also made sure that all of the plates were laid out perfectly this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Crook is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, and before being stationed at Stewart, he was Senior National Guard Advisor to the U.S. Cyber Command at Fort Meade, Maryland. He's deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, and he has received numerous awards and decorations, and we are so very glad to have him join us this morning. Please welcome Colonel Crook. Colonel Crook. Morning, everyone. First up, no pressure, right? <laughs> I'm comforted in seeing um, my Stewart family, and uh, especially seeing Gerard Lang, who accepted my invitation, a uh, native of uh, Newburgh, who's committed to uh, changing the community uh, with uh, Black Vanilla. It's a great meeting place for everyone. Thanks for coming. I am blessed and honored to share the stage with the folks up here. I thank you, Steve, and the committee for inviting me. I had a great time with you last night fellowshipping. Um, and it's uh, just been a tr truly an honor just being here for this short time in Orange County. Um, as we all know too well from experience and only watching a few minutes of the news coverage, Orange County, like the rest of our country and the world at large, is in need of prayer. Here, local families suffer under the weight of a still recovering economy, seeking to make their money last longer than their month. The lack of opportunity and a sense of hopelessness has driven far too many to self-medicate with opioids or turn to criminal enterprise where legitimate opportunities for participation and commercial enterprise 
are too few. Abroad, we continue to send young men and women from Orange County to fight in wars to preserve our way of life. This week, our nation and the world came together to recognize the service of so many in the military to keep our world and our nation free. The families who have sent their sons and daughters off to war know that it is right and fitting to do so. If last week's elections did nothing else, it continued to affirm that our national politics are divided. And no matter the outcome of any local election, we can be assured that in Washington, there will be a quarrel. But here in Orange County, this morning, we come together as a united community, united in the noblest of callings to pray together to God above for help, wisdom, and fortitude, and our call to be leaders in this community at this time. I joked last night with the committee uh, talking about how I was a young deacon in, in Columbus, Ohio, in a good old Baptist church. Um, I knew before going to church to eat a good breakfast and to pack a lunch <laughs> because we were going to be there for a while. I know that they only are serving us breakfast today, and I'm the first of many speakers to come before you. So while I miss my home church, I will not take you there this morning. <laughs> I'll take my seat soon. But before I do, as a leader, I have come to value that one can learn much from other leaders who have preceded you. This morning, I think the words of Frank, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt are instructive for our gathering. This man who led our country out of the Great Depression and the Second World War said, I ask that our people devote themselves in a continuance of prayer. As we rise to each new day, and again when each day is spent, let words of prayer be on our lips. So as to be clearly bipartisan, I also give you the words of President Ronald Reagan who said, freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. With that, let us pray. God above, we come to you this morning, first in thanksgiving, for your love and care for us. As leaders who are servants, we humble ourselves before you and pray. We cry out in a spirit of unity to you above to heal this land and the people and communities of Orange County. As entrusted leaders in this community, we ask that you grant us wisdom and discernment in our decision making. We ask that you strengthen us with the fortitude needed to endure the daily challenges of our positions. We ask that you give us a heart of compassion and empathy for the least of these in our community. Keep us forever focused on the fact that our greatness as leaders is best and only exhibited in our service to others. Lord, we pray for the families of Orange County who struggle with the daily economic shortfalls, addiction, and hopelessness. Help them to know that you are still a God of hope and second chances. And with and through you, all things are possible. Lord, finally today, we pray to you for peace. Peace in our homes, in our communities, in our nation, and in our world. In every holy book ever written, above all, you are a God of peace. We ask that your peace be our reality. Amen. Amen. Next this morning, we have the Old Testament reading. Uh, and and th this year, we have the Honorable Judge Carol Klein. She's family court and acting Supreme Court judge. Uh, we consider it such a blessing to have Judge Klein with us today. She is passionate about helping young people and families. Uh, twice now I've had the pleasure of having dinner with Judge Klein, and it, it pours out of her, that passion for families. Uh, she has served as mediator in Chestertown Court Justice. She was appointed to the Orange County Family Court and the Orange County Juvenile uh, Drug Court in 2000, as well as judge of the Ar Orange County Treatment Court. Judge Klein was with us at our inaugural breakfast, and we are thrilled to have her back again. Please welcome Judge Klein. Good morning, Orange County. Good morning. Good morning. The greatest thing was at 7 o'clock this morning to be awakened by the bagpipes. Wasn't that terrific? <laughs> 
as I was preparing today, I was thinking, what do we need? And we need loving kindness. So my talk is going to be from Genesis 24, and it's going to be loving kindness in the Torah. I'm giving the Jewish perspective from the Old Testament. When Abraham tells his servant to go to find a wife for Isaac and go with the 10 camels, the servant has to devise a plan. And in Genesis 24, 11 through 19, it talks about what this plan is. And it says, the servant took the camels, camels and the master, and departed, having all goodly things of the masters in the land in rows, and went to Aran Naharan in the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down with the city, the well of water, at the time of evening, the women go out and draw water. Why is that important? Because we later learn that in the next section, there is a woman, Rebecca, who comes out, and she is a pitcher upon her shoulder, a damsel very fair, and looks upon a virgin neither of any man known her, and goes and fills her pitcher. And the servant runs out to meet her and says, give me a drink, I pray thee, and a little water in thy pitcher. Drink, my lord, she hastens, and lets down the pitcher upon her hand and gives him drink. When she is done giving him drink, she says, I will draw for the camel also until they have done drinking. And she hastens and empties her pitcher to the trough and runs again to draw for the camels. Why is that important? That is important because in Judaism, we have an expression called gimelach chesed, loving kindness. Loving kindness in the Torah for the Chana Sarah and the commentary of Ishmar Shoach and Rabbi Herman Abramowitz talked about Abraham feeling the increasing weight of his years gives to Eliezer the steward to make sure that he finds the right mate for Yitzchak. And he says to Rebecca when she does this, like, why did you do this? And she did nothing in return. She did not expect anything in return. And God helps those who help themselves. Rebecca, when she drawed the water for the camels, in Genesis, it has been made abundantly clear the treatment of strangers takes the measure of society's moral code. Abraham and Lot put in their neighbors to shame. But Eliezer wanted more for Yitzchak. He wanted to have a lifetime partner, someone who was human quality of compassion that should extend to animals. Rebecca was stirred by the sight of the thirsting camels. Unsolicited, she volunteered and labored to end their discomfort. Eliezer saw in this person was incapable of violence, domestic or otherwise. Rebecca embodied the core value of Torah, which became known as Gumelat Chesem, the doing of acts of loving kindness. Moses Maimonides, who was one of the greatest philosophers, Jewish philosophers in 1138, stated the following, cruelty in Judaism is utterly alien. No Jewish community was to be a society devoted to the fostering of deeds of loving kindness, cheering brides and groom, visiting the sick, burying the dead, or comforting mourners. The Torah begins and ends with striking examples of acts of loving kindness. God clothing Abraham and Eve and bearing Moses personally. In between, there is every Jew is called upon to do these divine acts. Now you say to yourself, 
Why did Rebecca do this? Why did she do this selfless act of kindness? And what made it so special? Does kindness just affect the person on the receiving or the person giving it? The importance of chesed is considered one of the most important mitzvot. Judaism emphasizes this throughout legal codes and commentary. Chesed is commanded toward all of humanity as well as animals. It is highlighted in Jewish text and commentary covering from ethical to theological teachings. And there are two excellent examples of this. And what does Adonai require of you? To do justice, to love chesed, walk humbly and modestly and privately with your God, Micah 6, 8. And finally, in Pirkei vote, the section of the Mizra that focuses on ethical teaching. The world stands on three things, Torah, worship of God, and acts of chesed. If I leave you with one thought, the thought would be that every day we must do acts of loving kindness. We must be kind to each other, and every day I try to do one act. It may be a small act, it may be a large act. But I find that by doing this, this makes me a better person and connects me to society. I want to thank the prayer committee and everybody here today because I think it is so important what we are doing here today. Prayers and coming together as one for the betterment of everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Klein. Um, I, have you ever seen how much water a camel drinks? OK, I'm just going to, chesed is serious business. Serious business. Go Google it. Watch, watch how much a camel can drink. That's one camel. Thank you very much, Judge Klein. Excellent word. Our next speaker will share a faith story as she talks about prayer in her life. Sherilyn Schock is president of Yetter Insurance Agency, and she serves, along with her husband Jeff, as deacon in the Goodwill Church in Port Jervis. She has served for over 12 years on a committee for Young Life Tri-States. This is an international ministry to teenagers to give them guidance and positive role models. Sherry's an avid reader with a passion for early American history, and we welcome Sherry and what she has to share with us. Sherry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm usually speaking to or on behalf of teenagers, so if you don't mind, I'm going to picture you in blue jeans with, that are faded and a t-shirt, and it'll make it a little easier on me. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to tell a story this morning. It's not really my story. It's not really my family's story. It's God's story and how he wove our lives um, through our lives, the fabric of prayer and helped us through a very difficult time. I hail from the western part of Orange County. I'm a wife, mother, business owner, Jesus follower, and a book lover. And as a book lover, I love to tell stories and read stories. So I'm gonna tell you one this morning. March 15th, 2018 was an ordinary day. It was pretty cold out. We had just had the blizzard two weeks earlier. We'd finally gotten our electricity back. There was still a lot of snow around, trees down. My husband Jeff and I were at home relaxing, waiting for our youngest to get done with Young Life Club when the phone rang. We knew it wasn't our kids because our kids will only call our cell phone. So we knew that it, it would be someone else. And really, if you love someone who's an addict, you know that phone calls at odd times of the night, they don't usually come with good news. This phone call was no different. Our nephew Matthew was taken by ambulance to Bon Secours Hospital after he had collapsed at home. Thus began a running dialogue between us and God that weekend and for the next few days. Sometimes we used words, many times we used thoughts and groanings. C.S. Lewis says, I pray because I can't help myself. 
I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God, it changes me. I think this is true because the next few days were fraught with tension, waiting, pain, tears, and death. And through that, even though it was a painful time, I felt his calming presence. And it changed me, and it changed my family. So let me tell you a little bit about my nephew, Matthew. Matthew was a handsome, extremely intelligent, talented, and searching young man. When he was sober, he could create the most amazing meals in the kitchen. Unfortunately, his searching and his questioning led him to drugs and alcohol. And although he did overcome his addiction to heroin, which is unusual, he could never say goodbye to alcohol. And this trip to the hospital was not his first time. My husband Jeff is the one in the family to whom we all turn when things are difficult because he's very gentle, he's very loving, and he's got a calm personality. He quickly went to the hospital to be with his sister. And after picking up our son, I joined him. By the time we got to the hospital, Matthew had already lost consciousness. We would never see those brilliant blue eyes open again. We spent time over the next few days sitting by his side and talking, reading, and praying, playing music. St. Patrick said in a single day, I've said as many as 100 prayers, and in the night, almost as many. One of the blessings of the Christian life is the community of prayer that we have to back us up. Even when our own hearts hurt so much we, that we couldn't utter words to God, our friends and family were doing that on our behalf. I had many texts those next three days that were simply praying for you. The painful truth of this time was that Matthew had abused his body too much through his lifestyle to ever recoup. And two days later, on March 17th, his mother made the difficult decision to turn off life support. Pastor Jose was there with us and led our family in prayer as we said our goodbyes. And with his family and closest friends by his side, Matthew quietly passed away. This is not the end of the story. It isn't even the main thrust of the story. In fact, when we pray, we're not immediately removed from painful situations. We're not suddenly sitting on clouds playing with our harps. No, when we're praying, we're given direct access to a loving God. He patiently takes us through these trials and he sustains us. Many of our prayers these three days were not verbal. Some of them were just tearful groans, but the Lord heard the cry of our hearts. Let me leave you with the words of one of my favorite authors, Max Lucado, who says, our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. Our family is thankful today for the prayer of the one, the power of the one who heard our many prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, for reminding us to where our prayers are directed. God is good all the time, amen? Amen. 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 To share our New Testament reading today, we are very priv privileged to have Dr. Jason Adsit join us. I'm also thrilled because Dr. Adsit beckons from my uh, undergraduate alma mater. Uh, Dr. Adsit recently began his tenure as Mount St. Mary College's seventh full-time president in June. Uh, before joining the Mount, Dr. Adsit served as Dean of the School of Arts, Sciences, and Education, as well as the Director of the Educational Leadership Doctoral Program at Duville College in Buffalo. He also served as the Associate Provost for Academic Administration at the University of Rochester. Earlier in his career, he worked at both SUNY Buffalo and Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Adsit received his bachelor's degree in philosophy from American University in Washington, D.C., and his doctoral degree from SUNY Buffalo. We are grateful to have Dr. Adsit with us this morning. Please welcome Dr. Jason Adsit. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me in the back? I have five kids, so I can yell if I need to. Um, I realized this morning that I definitely need bifocals and I've been in denial for far too long, so the Lord definitely is working in mysterious ways today, sometimes more direct than others. Um, 
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom, Sophia, from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We live in a world where the virtue of humility has been rendered as something quaint, something ancient, and something to be avoided. Where people seek out fame simply to be famous. Where people film the suffering of others so that they can get attention. And where people mistake boasting braggadocio, and the belittling of others for leadership. This passage reminds us of the virtue and the value of humility. Because when God works, God works for the people who are left outside, the people who people shun, the people who are nullified. We all need to humble ourselves and remember that when we go out in the world. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Dr. Adsit. Praying for our county leaders today is Dr. Craig Amnott. Craig is a 1984 graduate of West Point Military Academy. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant into the infantry. His first assignment was to South Korea where he met his future bride, Good thing. <laughs> Young A. They married in 1991. They have four children and one grandchild. One grandchild. Dr. Amnott is a partner with the Horizon Family Medical Group, where he co-leads the largest and busiest primary care office in the group. He also serves on, as an elder on the board at Grace Community Church. He also serves as a short-term Christian medical mission team leader with Global Health Outreach. Here's a fun fact. Dr. Amnon is known to be one of the few remaining doctors to make house calls. Yes. I asked him if he had his little bag with him. He, he didn't bring it today. So. <laughs> Dr. Amnon also happens to be a very special friend. He also happens to be my personal physician, so if you could not tell him about the bacon, that would be really great. Please welcome Dr. Craig Amnon. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, King of kings, Lord of lords, full of grace and mercy, I humbly come before you as a sinner in need of a savior. And I thank you, Lord, that you sent that savior in the form of your son, Jesus Christ. This morning I come before you, Lord, to lift up leaders. As your word tells us, as your word tells us, Lord, to pray for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness, and to show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. I ask that each and every one of us in this room today would hear and heed your words in terms of how we are to respect, treat, and follow the leaders you have appointed over us. 
I come before you today to lift all of our leaders up to you. Republican leaders, Democratic leaders, independent leaders, Christian leaders, Jewish leaders, Muslim leaders, all leaders, Lord. I lift them all up to you and ask that they would be wise and serve you with fear and celebrate your rule with trembling. That they would know that your word says that you will hold them accountable for your flock. That leadership is a gift that you have given them and that you expect them to steward that gift wisely and for the purpose of glorifying and honoring you. I specifically lift up the leaders of our nation, our state, and of this county, Orange County, New York. I lift up our county executive, Steve Newhouse, as he prepares for a combat deployment to Afghanistan and the Middle East. As a retired Army combat veteran myself, Lord, I lift my naval brethren, Steve, and his family up to you in prayer. I lift his wife, Rachel, and their children, Emma, Charlotte, Christoph, and Barrett. I ask that this pending time of separation would be a time of spiritual renewal and strength for the Newhouse family. In closing, we acknowledge you as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of heaven and earth, God of love, God of peace, God of grace, God of mercy, God of order. We thank you for the leaders you have appointed over us. We lift them up to you. We ask that, you would, that we would be followers and that our leaders would be leaders that someday get to hear you say to each and every one of us, well done, good and faithful servant. We love you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. amen. That's how every uh, physical visit ends, by the way. <laughs> Me in awe of uh, Craig's prayer, prayer life, always. Thank you for, for covering all county leaders in prayer. Our keynote speaker this morning is Honorable Judge James Pagonis. Judge Pagonis is a lifelong resident of Dutchess County. He has practiced law in New York since 1977. He received his undergraduate degree from Virginia Military Institute and his law degree from Western New England University. After serving as a confidential law clerk and a family court judge, he was elected in 1998 as Dutchess County's surrogate court judge, a position he has held ever since and will retire from very soon in December. <laughs> In addition, Judge Pagona serves as Acting Justice of the Supreme Court. He was appointed to the New York State Advisory Committee on Judicial Ethics in 2015. Judge Pagona and his wife Joan have served in the Gideon's Ministry since 1990, and more recently as deacons at Grace Community Church. They also serve on the Dutchess County Prayer Breakfast Committee. They have two children, Jordan and Julia, of whom they are enormously proud. Please welcome. Judge Pagonis. Well, good Wednesday morning, Orange County. You know, as the writer in Psalm 113, verse 3 proclaims, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. What a great blessing we share in this room for such a time as this. Thank you, Larry for your gracious introduction. Thank you, Dot Magnelli and the Orange County Leadership Prayer Breakfast Committee for inviting me to address you this morning. It's an honor and privilege I gratefully accept. You know, ladies and gentlemen, um, some of you may not be aware of the origins of the Orange County Prayer Breakfast Committee. With a nod and attribution to my friend Chris Pantano, 27 years ago, the Westchester County Prayer Breakfast begot the Putnam County Prayer Breakfast Committee and Breakfast. Six years ago, the Putnam County Prayer Breakfast Committee begot the Dutchess County Leadership Prayer Breakfast Committee. And four years ago, the Dutchess County Committee begot the Orange County Leadership Prayer Breakfast. And it's my understanding that Orange County is looking to beget Ulster County. <laughs> so as you can see, there's been a whole lot of begotten going on. You know, I would be remiss if I did not join all of us in thanking County Executive Steve Newhouse for 
your steadfast support hosting such an important event as we join together to lift up to, lift up to our Heavenly Father the leadership of Orange County through our prayers and supplications. And as you prepare to deploy to the Middle East serving in your capacity as an officer in the Naval Reserves, a grateful citizenry thanks you for your faithful and sacrificial service to our country. Our prayers will follow and blanket you and your team. May our Heavenly Father serve as your rock, your strength and shield. May you take refuge in the shelter of his wings. And may he bring you and your unit home safely to your loved ones as you give him the honor and praise his great name deserves. Thank you. Thank you. As, um, as I survey the room and note the presence of the flower of leadership of Orange County, eminent citizens, guests, and acknowledge the distinguished individuals here on the dais, I cannot help but be inspired knowing Orange County is richly blessed with a wonderfully gifted and diverse array of leaders from many professions and callings. At the same time, at least for me, it can be a tad intimidating standing in the presence of such a prominent audience. It reminds me of a news report I recently read about in which a reporter interviewed a 104-year-old woman. And what do you think is the best thing about being 104 years old, the reporter asked. No peer pressure, she replied. <laughs> So let's take it from there. <laughs> so when Dot and I discussed today's breakfast, we talked about what would be an appropriate subject which will honor the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the heroes and heroines of the Old Testament, the apostles, disciples, and saints of the New Testament, and my personal Savior, Jesus Christ. After praying and receiving prompting from the Holy Spirit, Along with your indulgence, my friends, what I'd like to share with you this morning is a story as well. It's a story about a man and an event in his life which occurred on December 2nd, 2003. What follows is entirely true. There is no embellishment. Nothing has been added or subtracted from what actually took place in a most remarkable way. The man in question is an insulin-dependent diabetic, and on the night of December 2nd, 2003, he took his insulin prior to dinner, as was his custom. He waited about an hour before driving to an exercise facility where he was a member for a non-strenuous workout. After showering, he got into his car for the five to eight minute drive home. His last memory was being about a half a mile down the road from the gym. It was approximately 9.38 or 9.48 p.m. The man had just turned on the radio to listen to the end of a hockey game. And that was the last thing he recalled before blacking out. The man awoke in an ambulance which was transporting him to a hospital. He was hooked up to a glucose IV. From the front of the vehicle, he could hear the voice of his wife. The man said to the EMT, who are you and what am I doing here? The EMT responded telling him that he had experienced a severe hypoglycemic or low blood sugar episode that he had passed out and his car had come to a stop after running into a street sign without sustaining any significant damage. When the man asked the EMT about his blood sugar reading, he was told it was in the mid to upper 20s. A normal reading is anywhere between 70 and 99. The EMT told the man that he was literally seconds away from drifting into an insulin-induced coma, which could have caused brain damage, a possible heart attack, and even death. The man was reassured he had not suffered any physical injuries. Now at this point, the man was utterly astounded when he learned his car was not anywhere near his home. Incredibly, he and the car had traveled over a different road for about five miles from the point where he lost consciousness until striking the street sign. This road was dark, hilly, and winding with a bridge over a creek. The man was treated at the hospital and released to go home with his wife. A coworker of the man had been alerted to what had occurred by an eyewitness. He drove to the hospital to provide them with a ride home. And during that ride, the coworker informed the man that a woman who had previously worked with him five years ago 
was the witness to what had transpired. She was the one who made the call. The next day, the man called the woman to find out what she had observed. The woman related, while driving home from a second job, she found herself behind a police car, which was following the man's car for the last portion of the five-mile odyssey. She later learned that several motorists had called the police to report a car traveling in an erratic manner. She told the man that in the darkness, she could see his car slowly veering to the right and left at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. Cars were able to avoid hitting his car while the police car cautiously followed from behind. The man's car eventually stopped when it struck a street sign in front of a well-lit gas station. At that point, the man and his car were roughly 200 yards from the municipal police station. The airbags had not deployed due to the car's slow rate of speed. The witness then described how the officer got out of his vehicle and warily approached the man and his car. The engine was still running. The man was slumped over the steering wheel. The bright lights emanating from the gas station allowed the witness to observe what was unfolding. She watched the officer open the door to the car and turn off the engine. He then pushed the man off the steering wheel to see if he was conscious. Several slaps to the face brought no response. It was at this moment the woman recognized the man. She got out of her car and approached the officer. She noticed the man was soaked in sweat. Perspiration was streaming down his face. His jacket looked like a dark, saturated washcloth. She told the officer, I know this man. He's not drunk. He's a diabetic, and he needs help fast. Instead of treating the man as a possible DWI or drug-induced suspect, the officer radioed for an ambulance. The ambulance was only a quarter mile away. It arrived within minutes. The EMTs were able to quickly diagnose and treat the man for hypoglycemia and in all likelihood save his life. After concluding their conversation, the man called the florist to deliver a bouquet of flowers to the woman as a small expression of his appreciation for helping save his life. He then sat down to reflect on the profound implications of this stunning experience. His initial thought was to completely reject any notion or conclusion that this all came about as a result of coincidence, happenstance, chance, or just plain luck. The sequence of events and placement of such a crucial witness so as to help spare him from either serious injury or death was the result of something more, much more. So, as he often did each morning, the man opened his Bible and searched the scriptures for the answer. With the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the man discovered the reason. When he recounted how his car was able to travel close to five miles while he was blacked out over a bridge on a dark, hilly, and winding road without plunging into the creek or ditch or strike a tree, guardrail, or structure, nor collide with another vehicle or cause harm to others, he was led to Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. When he realized he could not he could have just as easily driven to his home only to pass out in the driveway, suffer harm, or die while his loved ones waited inside for his return. Psalm 46, verse 1, reassured him, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When he recalled how someone who knew him but had not, had not seen him in five years was placed in the line of traffic in just the right position at precisely the right moment, to identify him and his condition to the officer so that an ambulance only a quarter mile away could arrive quickly to administer critical medical care to save him from a potentially serious calamity or even death. Psalm 121 verses 3, 7, and 8 spoke to his heart. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. When he realized that the only damage were some minor scratches and dents to his car, that he was essentially unscathed, and thankfully no other person harmed or property ruined, Isaiah 41.10 explained, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
At this point, the man began to weep a lot. He sank to his knees and looked heavenward. A still soft voice whispered from Psalm 50, verse 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. He then asked God, what would you have me do, Lord? How can I possibly express my gratitude in such a way so as to honor you? The answer was swift. The Holy Spirit gently breathed the words of Jesus from the 19th verse of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Mark. Go home to your people and report to them what good things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Then he understood. He understood why he had to tell the story. With the words from Psalm 89 verse 1 planted firmly in his heart, with my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. He wanted to reaffirm to people that God intervenes in our lives today, just as he did in biblical times, that he is the author of everyone's destiny. Whether we are showered with success or sustained in sorrow, he is always with us. That he makes a way where there is no way. That he can operate outside the odds because he is all powerful. That nothing is too difficult for him. And that he reveals his power in both ordinary circumstances and impossible ones. <laughs> I know because the man whose life he saved on December 2nd, 2003 was me. the Lord placed in my, my path that evening is Monica Bender. Monica was a probation officer who had worked with me during the time I had the privilege of serving as a family court judge, but we had not seen each other in the five years after I left that court to begin serving as Dutchess County surrogate. The co-worker is Ken Bernstein, my law clerk, until his retirement in 2010. And my wife, well, Joan will always be the beautiful bride of my youth the Proverbs 31 wife and mother of our family, and my best friend. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and the Orange County Leadership Prayer Breakfast Committee for affording me the honor and joy of sharing my faith story with you this morning. May each of you enjoy an abundance of the Lord's blessings throughout this day. He has made for each one of us no exceptions, and that you experience his peace, which transcends all comprehension. Always, God is good, and God is good, yes. always. Thank you. Thank you so very much. What? Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing with us that story, inspiring us this morning, Judge Pagonis. Congratulations for your work. Uh, thank you for your service on the bench and for the Lord. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed it yet or if you were wondering. We have two Supremes up here. So I thought a little baby love. <laughs> Larry, Larry and the Supremes. <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> I'm going to spare. I'm going to spare you. I'll spare you. But I happen to know that one of these judges has an excellent voice. I'll let you figure that out. There you go. It's up to you to figure that out. Uh, we'll now have a response from our host, Orange County Executive Steve Newhouse. Steve has served Orange County since 2014. He also serves our country, as you have heard, as Lieutenant Commander of the Naval Reserves. Steve and his wife, Rachel, are the proud and very busy parents of four young children. Actually, before dinner last night, Steve had to, you know, rinse them in the tub before he could come. As Craig mentioned, and as Judge uh, uh, prayed for, Steve is being deployed to serve our country, and we ask again that you hold him and his family and his fellow soldiers in your thoughts and prayers. Another fun fact, uh, Steve's birthday is tomorrow on the 15th. And his eldest turns nine on the same day. So please welcome Stephen Newhouse. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to start. Colonel Crook, could you stand up, please? 
But now, besides being our representative from the Air National Guard, and I see the whole team here, our wing commander, and, and everybody's here, he's also in charge of complaints this morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> so unless you're over six feet tall and think you can take it, if you don't like your breakfast, don't like the curriculum, you can see him afterwards. Uh, so good morning, it's great to be here today. I wanna to first thank the prayer committee. Um, you got, I'm like the Tasmanian de devil to work with. I'm coming late, everything's spinning all over the place. And uh, you know, I see my staff shaking their heads. And, uh, but I really do appreciate it. They're in my office, I'm running home, I'm either going to see my kids or going to another event, and they're planning next year's breakfast. So uh, I really want to thank the whole committee. We had a wonderful time last night at dinner. We were joking around, goofing off. And uh, the judge and I got to talk about his son. Everybody does prayers for me, and I'll talk about real quickly about that later on. But, I mean, his son did multiple tours. Him and Joni, who I've known Joan for over a decade when she was a supervisor. She was a mentor to me back then, and we've been friends ever since. But their son has made multiple sacrifices all over the world and continues to do that. So uh, thank you very much, Judge and, and Joan. So... Uh, in the military, we have what's called a, uh, at least in the, I did, ar I did Army first, so I see some Army uniforms in there. I did four years, I wore that uniform. Uh, I was an enlisted guy. And, uh, but when I went to the Navy, they gave out these books, the senior enlisted guys, and they said, this is called a wheel book. And they said, uh, if the skipper writes something down, uh, if he says something important and you need to remember it, write it down, or we'll, we'll remind you with our boot. So, uh, so I, I kind of keep a lot of these around. A lot of my good friends know I give this out to people. I give this out to kids or, or people like that. Like, always keep this in your pocket. You can hide something this small to write down important things. So uh, I want to talk about just a couple of quick things and, and how I tick and what, what goes through my mind. I, we have a lot of great elected officials in the room today, a big contingent from my Orange County legislature, department heads, the DA who is a very close partner and I on a lot of things here at the Sheriff's Office. The Judiciary, we have the two highest ca uh, county criminal court judges here, local town judges here, our surrogates courts judge is here. So uh, we are very well represented as well as obviously the people behind me. So thank you for coming here. Be because really this is uh, a leadership breakfast to pray for the elected officials to make sure that they make the right decisions. And so uh, one of the things that people hate doing with me is driving with me. I tend to drive very quick. I feel like, I'm like we just left a, a bank robbery. And uh, I, I also talk, I, I read the signs out loud. And people are like, I can read, Steve, I can read. But I love reading the church signs in front of churches. And uh, I'm stationed out of a place called Little Creek Special Warfare Base in Virginia, and I drive there pretty much every month. It's a seven hour plus drive, plus or minus. And over the summer, I saw a church that had a sign in the middle of nowhere. This is like in the middle of nowhere between, uh, just before you get to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, there's nothing out there. I think it's Maryland at that point. But the church said, don't blame God for things that people do. Don't blame God for, and this is in the height of a lot of these shootings that were going on. And one of the challenges that the district attorney and I have in law enforcement is when we have the sheriff's office here in, in, in force and a lot of people, Pete Tui, one of our county legislators, him and I were at a police meeting last night with over 250 law enforcement officers. And one of the most difficult jobs that we have is talking to people about tragedies, a death, an overdose. And the first thing that people ask us is why would God do this? If we have a God, why do we do and, and now, we're not members of the clergy. The district attorney, myself, law enforcement, uh, we're believers. Uh, we leave that to people like Jared to try to filter that through and the rest of the, the, the leadership. But we're, we are pretty much laymen. And we get this question all the time. And one of the beauties I have as county executive is I do get wonderful examples of inspiration of why we have a God. Because I'm one of those people that always like, this is a sign, this is a sign. I'm totally that guy. I'm the person that's always saying, this is happening for a reason. It's going to be great. It's going to be a good job. Or it's the way uh, God wants it to be. One of my quotes that I always quote all the time, which you guys would be like, oh my gosh, is Garth Brooks. I say it all the time. Thank God for unanswered prayers. We pray so hard and we ask for this or that and we want this and it goes a different way. Uh, Carol Klein, the judge, and I were talking about this last night. But it, it ends up working out somehow. And I, and I have 100% faith. So I just want to talk real, uh, I'm going to talk real quickly about Eisenhower at the end, but I just want to mention uh, Danny Mulvey. He was a long, young kid from Chester. I think he was 21 when he died, young kid. Uh, most of his life he had cancer. And this kid is, was such a strong, 
spiritual, peen, teeny little kid. Half the time he was in a wheelchair and he tried to do everything. He loved two things in the world. He loved the U.S. military and he loved God. He would not miss church. He would not. He would pray every day, and uh, you know I became friends and closely with the family. A beautiful family. He's got a, a sister and, and a father. Is, was a New York City retired cop, and a mother. I mean, this kid brought generals down to tears. And a month before he died, we started rolling in, you know, support people to try to keep his spirits up. I bought Navy SEALs. They were crying. Uh, Air National Guard came out in force, gave them helmets. The pilots gave them patches up until that, uh, hours before he died. But a month before he passed away, he was in very bad shape, and his parents were very spiritual as well. And he told, he never, had, never complained about life. Why did God do this to me? You know, why did I, why did I, was born like this? Always positive and thankful to be alive for the small amount of time he was on this earth. And the thing that was really striking, his father said this at the eulogy, was when he was on his deathbed, a month before he died, he asked his dad, he's like, you know, his father was crying, and he said, um, Dad, you want me to pray for you? And his father was so moved, and I'm trying to keep it back because it's just such a positive example of somebody that really got it, got the whole thing, whole life that dedicated to try helping. He would be out funerals, supporting firefighters after they come in at night, even though the kid was in a wheelchair, giving out food. And he asks his father, can I pray for you? And he did. He put his hand on his father's head and prayed for his father, even though he was the one that was suffering at the end but to give his father the strength. So when we hear, and it's very difficult, some of the things that we, we face, we take it personally. The county legislature just came up with a committee this year to help com combat opiates, because every community we're seeing it, black, white, Latino, what, poor, rich, whatever, it's, it's non-discriminating, as, as the district attorney says, and it's horrible. Uh, so I do see bright lights, and I do see God's work. I, I'm gonna mention one group here in the audience, and. and wrote this down. This isn't because I see you guys. Chris Molinelli, he's got the coolest hairdo in the room. Uh, Chris runs Honor, our homeless shelter in Orange County. And I know most of the 99, or if not everybody in this room, does this all the time. But if you need to inspire a young man or a, a person that's having a tough time in their life, going through a divorce, maybe facing addiction, losing their jobs, spend a couple hours volunteering with this guy. They have a number of men and women and families and even runaway kids that really, that we call them sometimes ninjas. No income, no job, no assets. They pretty much have no hope, nothing going for them. And this organization gives them a nice warm bed at night, gives them food, gives them opportunities to get the kids to the schools, to try to get them back to the school districts that they're from. They really are doing wonderful things. And uh, I've been there a couple times on Thanksgiving where they give them a meal, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So uh, there are miracles, and there's God works happening in this county, and, and, and I see a lot of people in this room, you guys in particular, so thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just I'm gonna talk real quickly about President Eisenhower. Now, he was elected president. He ran in 1952. And, and this guy, he's a, he's a role model to me, a hero. Uh, this poor guy uh, was the leader during the uh, European campaign during World War II fighting fascism and literally making decisions to put men and women in harm's way, knew, knowing that they were going to die, uh, but have, having to get the job done. He was a very devout religious man, a very private man, and uh, he, when he left there, he became the president of Columbia uh, University, and then he uh, was, was, you know, uh, decided to run for president. When he got elected president, he was concerned about the United States becoming too secular, uh, religion being pushed out of our, um, our, our everyday life. And uh, so he decided to, to, to pe give people a curveball. And six weeks before election, uh, before his inauguration, he decided to r write his own prayer. And he, most of the people didn't know, the, the News Corps didn't know. He started his inaugural by, by saying, look guys, uh, I, I, I wrote my own prayer and I want to read it to you today. So I'm going to read it. It's very quick and it's uh, very powerful and uh, it's, it's really awesome. At the end of his prayer, the United States government made copies of it and gave it out to people. How about that? Would that happen today? I mean, it's pretty cool. So he says, Almighty God, as we stand here at this moment, my associates in the executive branch of government join me in beseeking 
thou will make full and complete our dedication to the service of the people in this throng and their fellow citizens everywhere. Give us, we pray, the power to discern clearly right from wrong and allow all our words and actions to be governed thereby and by the laws of the land. Especially, we pray that our concern shall be for all the people, regardless of station, race, or calling. May cooperation be permitted and the mutual aim of those who hold to differing political beliefs so that all may work for the good of our beloved country. Thy God, uh, thy glory, amen. How beautiful is that? Amen. Our president. Now, I will tell you, a lot of people are saying, oh my gosh, Steve, that's uh, 1953. We're in 2018, and we're as polarized as you can get. Last night, a lot of people on this prayer committee have been to the National Prayer Breakfast. And some people in this room might not be fond of Barack Obama's presidency. Some people might not be fond of Donald Trump's presidency. But everybody said universally, they are beautiful, great national prayer services down there every year. Unquestionable. So as good or bad as things might be or not, that's still alive down there. So uh, I'm going to end with one thing. We talk about the military. In my military service, you, you don't have to worry about me. We have a lot of people from Orange County. We have about 200 Orange County residents mobilizing in the next 30 to 40 days going to the Middle East. And those as a group, uh, many of them law enforcement, some of them not, uh, those folks need prayers uh, for their safety. But I will tell you, there's, there's an unappreciated group in the military. They're called the chaplain. We call them in the Navy chaps. It might be slang. The Army might call them something. You, they might call them by their rank. But regardless, they're all different denominations. They're even Jewish rabbis that, that you, it, and you just get who you get. You get a group of people like this, uh, which is probably half a battalion in this room, and you get one guy or one girl, and you don't know where they're from. They, they might be Catholic, they might be Protestant, they might be a rabbi, and I've had them all in my career. Uh, but I will tell you, they're a beacon of support and, and, and hope when you do go and do different things. So when I was in Korea, I was in this place called the B-1 Bunker. It's a nuclear bomb-proof bunker that the Americans go. If, all, if the apocalypse comes in Korea, the Americans would run a lot of operations there. And it's about two miles into this rock mountain. And uh, you're doing 12-hour shifts. And I remember somebody said, any Christians in here? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. And uh, they're like, yeah, we're doing a Christian mass down the hall. So I'm like, all right, cool. You know, give me a break. Get to pray a little bit. And I go, and I'm the only guy. Now. That's my only intimidating thing. I don't mind sitting with a flock of 20, 30 plus people, but when you got to sit one on one and make sure that your prayers are crisp, that's where the, that's where the stress level goes up for the county executive. And uh, I'm like, look, you want me to go back and try to find people? I'm like, no, no, no. Well, you're good. You're good. You're good. And uh, that's the time when the county executive is at his, at his ner most nervous. I'm like, please, God, please let me remember these at the right time. Uh, but I, I will tell you, uh, there's such good stuff happening. I am, I'm an optimist, and I'm at peace. I'm 45 years old. I've been blessed. I have beautiful kids, and uh, I have a great job. I have a great community. We see miracles. Even though we see tragedies every day, we see miracles. There's just as many, if not more. You just got to look in the right spot. And uh, Judge Klein and, and the president of Mount St. Mary, who I love, because I went to Mount St. Mary, and he's got one more child than me, so he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it comes to our conduct here. When's the last time anybody in this room, and I'm, I'm going to leave on this, and I said this last year, one of the biggest problems we have in, in society is suicides, too. We deal with them all the time, all the time. And uh, one of the biggest ways they say to prevent somebody from committing suicide is a stranger coming up to them saying, Good morning. How are you? Walking by, hey, how are you? Now, New Yorkers, it's very difficult. I'm going to be, I'm going to be at the World Trade Center at 2 o'clock. I, I roll down a couple of those blocks before the World Trade Center, and I say good morning. They're going to be like, there's a crazy guy, gray suit, yellow tie. Or you'll get some profanity thrown back at you. But we're a little bit removed upstate in the country. Uh, we, can, uh, we can deal with that. When you're getting coffee in the morning, when you're shopping, uh, when you're walking into your office, good morning, how are you? Those common, small, little pleasantries uh, open a door and, and, and maybe, maybe it'll change somebody's life. Maybe it'll open up, maybe it'll open up to a conversation where you can talk to them about what you do. Maybe you could talk to them about the, the Lord's word. Those are the type of things I think about. And uh, I will tell you, 
As your county exec, I, I am very proud. The stuff we have here, we have Democrats and Republicans in the legislature, we're almost unanimous all the time. Democrats and Republicans. They confirmed my new deputy county executive two months ago. They knew I was going overseas, that it could have been a political issue. Nope, unanimous, whatever you need. So uh, we, there are beautiful examples of how you can make things different, despite what you read in the newspapers, despite what you see on TV every night, and they're right in front of us. So uh, thank you, God bless you for being here. We're gonna continue to do this. Next year will be our five years. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. So thank you very much, have a great day. Thank you, Steve. Dave Torres it will deliver our closing prayer. Dave has over 20 years experience as a New York State Court Officer. Currently he's serving as Senior Court Officer here in Orange County. Uh, he conducts a weekly Bible study every Friday at work and he's a member of the Family Church in Middletown. He has a passion for prayer and he has served as a member of the Brooklyn Tabernacles Prayer Band for four years. Dave lives in Montgomery with his wife and two children. Welcome Dave Torres. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to take a minute, I have to, to thank the Prayer Breakfast Committee, and in particular, my good friend, Dot Magnelli, for this great privilege. <laughs> Isn't this awesome? I mean, I look around and I see people from all backgrounds and cultures, and I'm just blown away by God's goodness. We turn on our TVs at home and watch the news, and it can be disheartening at times, but when you look around now, it is a good reminder to us that God is at work. He is moving, and he's making things happen for his good and his purposes. Amen? Amen. So uh, let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. Thank you, first of all, God, because we have sensed your presence here in our midst, O oh Lord. We've heard you. we felt you. And Lord, we're reminded in your word that you say where two or three are gathered, you are there in our midst, O oh God. We praise you for that, Lord Jesus. And Father, I thank you for each and every person here on this platform, Lord God, who's taken their time to do what they've done today, Lord. I pray that you bless them and guide them and lead them in all that they do. Grant them favor on every side, O oh Lord Jesus. I pray for the audience that's out here seated in front of me, Lord Jesus. You know each and every situation, O oh God, and I pray that you bless them as well, Lord God. Grant them the wisdom and courage they may need in all of their endeavors, Lord Jesus. I want to take a moment also to pray for the staff here at Anthony's Pier 9, Lord God, who has served us so diligently and kindly, Lord God. I pray you bless them and their families as well, Lord God. And Lord, finally, I want to just pray, Lord, that as we leave here now, Lord, you will guide us and keep us, Lord, in all our traveling. And Lord God, I pray that you make us a light wherever we go, Lord Jesus, that we may bring the light of your love everywhere we go. And I pray this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.